It's on the crypto assets and cryptocurrency. I know you are um, uh, maybe part of the fan of the crypto assets. That's the reason why you come uh, uh, among the uh, traffic jam and arrive here so early. So thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, and with the uh, global digital payment volumes predicted by an uh, average of 10% into the 2020, and they also the uh, prices of the uh, cryptocurrency ups and downs and uh, very dramatically in the last year, few years. We know the highest to the 20,000 and now to lower than 7,000. So uh, uh, among this kind of very volatile markets and also a lot of craze, the regulators have the issue. So uh, in this panel, we're going to talk about how can regulators and the uh, businesses and also consumers and investors and work together to um, support this burgeoning, burgeoning crypto markets while safeguarding the uh, financial order. So it's, a, uh, it's kind of a, a very complicated issue, but they, uh, we have to work together for a better future for, for the crypto assets. So we have a, a great panel today, a very, very good combination. And to uh, my uh, left, um, Mr. Uh, Vigi, sorry, Virginius Sinkavicius. Am I right? You did well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Minister of the uh, Economy of the Lithuania, a very uh, young but very um, good regulator, have a lot of experience on the, on the economy. And uh, uh, next to him, uh, Mr. Mike. Kayamori, uh, he is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the uh, Core Queen of the uh, Japan. Welcome. And uh, uh, next to, to, to him, um, Ms. Uh, Melton Dimitros, um, she is the uh, Chief St uh, Strategy Officer and Managing Director of the uh, uh, Coin Shares. And uh, she has been uh, in United States and UK and Canada, so she can uh, represent a lot of the countries and the country's attitudes towards the crypto assets. And the last but not least, uh, Jeremy uh, Alera, um, uh, Alea, he is the founder and the Chief Executive Officer of the Circle Internet Financial. He's from the United States and also can uh, talk a, uh, a little bit about re uh, regulation and also the uh, innovation uh, in the United States and elsewhere. So let me um, start with the uh, price of the uh, asset currency. If we look at the uh, um, Bitcoin, and we have done a lot of research on the pricing and the valuation of the Bitcoin. And the result is that according to several different valuation models, the Bitcoin's price should be at um, 7,000 or uh, 4,000 or something around that um, range. So at that time, we know that we have the, the very hype of the uh, Bitcoin now uh, below seven. So do you think now it's a rational market and now is the valuation is right from a Japan view? Because uh, Japan, a lot of the craze for the Bitcoin, a very supportive uh, uh, government attitudes there. Please, Mike. Yeah, so um, it, it's, a, it, it's a great question. And I'm not sure if there's a... Um, a good answer for that. That said, um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, the price of Bitcoin was less than $1,000. Yeah. Right? So that was January 2017. And it went up to 20000 now it's $7,000. Um, the price to, the cost to mine Bitcoin is about $6,000. Yeah. So if the price of Bitcoin goes down under that, most mining companies will go out of business. So to that extent, when you look at from a cost price analysis, that you could say that $6,000 with the difficulty of mining right now could be the floor. So if it goes under, um, it's, a, it's, it's an attractive price. So that's how you can potentially look at it. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to look at the short term and see what it is, but when you look at if there's positive news, it goes up. When there's negative news, it goes down. But you can see compared to other alternative tokens that the price of Bitcoin um, in the past three, four months has kind of been in a, in a, in a range. So yeah. I look at this as a probably like a market equilibrium. But what about the uh, prices of other cryptocurrency and assets? Do you think they're also rational or uh, what about their prices level? I think um, um, some are and some are not. And I think, I think the general sentiment, when you look at specifically Japan, 
I would say maybe half of the user base joined the crypto asset um, around late last year, October, November, December. So the Japanese regulation went in and the first license was granted end of September. So from October was when the retail customers came in. So most of the people were able to enjoy when the price went up, but who joined in December, they're all underwater. So from that perspective, there is a negative sentiment um, within the Japanese retail customers, and even more so for the alternative coins, because some are scams, and it's very difficult from an end retail customer to really see the difference between a potential real alternative token that is doing well and, and a potential scam. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy? Sure. Uh, a, little, a little perspective. I think, um, you know, uh, first, uh, it's important that there's, people understand there's um, a wide range of different types of crypto assets, and they all have different fundamental value propositions. They all have, you know, different ways to assess them from a valuation perspective. And I would say the, the institutional market is just now starting to build frameworks for valuation analysis on these. Um, I think a lot of the, the growth in the market was not driven by fundamental valuation analysis. It was driven by entirely by retail uh, speculative interest. Uh, you know, and so you know, not all crypto assets are created equal. Some are, are very much oriented at, at kind of payments use cases. Some are oriented at kind of being commodity uh, technology platforms. And, and some are more security-like in nature. Um, and, and they all have to be looked at very differently. I, I think, you know, stepping back, though, when you look at the growth in, in the asset class last year, um, sitting behind that was a fundamental thesis and a belief. And the thesis uh, was one of a couple things. One was a thesis that a non-sovereign digital gold was going to take hold. And that's the Bitcoin thesis. And, uh, and that's a very, I think, a very compelling thesis. And there's a very good long-term case for a non-sovereign digital gold. That could have enormous scale. Um, but there's another thesis, which is that blockchain platforms uh, allow for a new form of global record keeping, transaction processing, and computing that is decentralized, and that that kind of new platform infrastructure that is public and not controlled by any company or government is something that we can build completely new forms of, of businesses and operations and, uh, and value around. And that thesis, the sort of blockchain as platform thesis, uh, I think is a big part of the, the secular interest here and drove a lot of the initial growth. Uh, but a, a lot of the price movement was very much driven by retail demand. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, it's I think, um, you know, the price levels are pretty rational now. Uh, you know, a, a kind of 80% corrections, we, you know, when, when we saw the bubble growing, we thought, okay, there's probably a 70 to 80% correction coming, uh, and that's very much what we've seen. Uh, and now I think the market is looking for um, what are the, you know, the real applications that are actually going to derive value from this. I think people want to sort of see, put money where your mouth is, so to speak. They want to see the use cases come alive. And once you see the use cases coming alive, then I think you see uh, a, another kind of appreciation, but where you have the assets decoupled, right? So they're not all going to trade in parallel, which is completely irrational. They're, they're going to be decoupled uh, and, and really more uh, intrinsically valued based on real frameworks for valuation. Yeah, thank you for the uh, sharing a very interesting and also different uh, um, angles uh, towards the uh, crypto assets. You, you touched upon the public. Uh, when we uh, uh, view the uh, uh, crypto assets, do you think it's a, a more a private experiment on the uh, um, currency and on the, uh, uh, the platform, or uh, the public should play a big role there? If public have a role here, then it might be centralized instead of the decentralized. But crypto assets, the dream of the crypto assets is we are decentralized. So how do you look at that? Yeah, I mean, this is like the next layer of the internet. And this is a, a broad-based build-out of technology that is open infrastructure, the same way the rest of the internet is open infrastructure. No government controls the internet. No corporation controls the internet. And it's just another layer of the internet that's being built out. And, um, but that, that involves you know, private sector innovation, academic computer science innovation, regulators' involvement. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an either-or. It's multiple stakeholders that have to be involved in, in how this technology gets developed and applied. But fundamentally, it's just a new public infrastructure that's available to all of us to build on top of the same way the, the web, TCPIP, email, other things 
uh, are available for us to build on top of. Yeah, we'll dig deeper a, a little later. Before that, a, uh, um, a Melton, do you, um, how do you look at the price and the uh, ration or, yeah? So I view the world, I think, slightly differently. To me, cryptocurrency is fundamentally what we're experimenting with here. What's so interesting is a revolution in how capital in our world is formed. So historically, if you wanted to finance a company, an idea, maybe you would pursue debt financing from a bank. Then venture capital came along, and you could pursue equity financing, which is a market that's really active in the US especially. There's a lot of venture capital, a lot of startups. And I worked in the venture space in cryptocurrency for quite some time. And what we're seeing now, really, to me, the emergence of ICOs, Bitcoin and Ethereum in particular, for investors who bought these assets early, created a lot of wealth. And what they wanted to do was to continue investing in this vision that Jeremy described, this vision of a decentralized second layer to the internet, one where payments are actually digitally native. And so these people who are already motivated by this idea started to take their capital and to invest it in new ways outside of the existing structure that exists today, which is the form of an initial coin offering. And so I think the challenge is, is that now that the world has discovered ICOs, everyone wants an easy button, right? They want to hit the button, raise money, and not really have to think about rules and regulations and laws. But there's a reason that the financial system in most countries is the most regulated part of an economy. And it's because of consumer protections and fraud and all these other issues that occur whenever you have people dealing with capital. And so I think the point we're at now, what we've seen, we went through this mania. And what I liken it to is Carlotta Perez, who's an academic at MIT, wrote this fantastic book about how typically financial production and actual capital production, um, they're decoupled, especially in the early stages of a new technology. We saw it with railroads in the 1800s. We saw it with the internet in the 1990s. I think it's fairly common when there's new technology for there to be a lot of excitement and everyone wants to invest. And so we saw this with ICOs where prices were completely decoupled from any sort of rational valuation. But at the end of the day, I'm a free market capitalist and price ultimately is supply and demand meeting an equilibrium, and there is supply. I think what we've all learned in our industry is there's a tremendous appetite for crypto assets, and now the question is, will we internally, as industry leaders, work together to bring some rationality, to bring some standards and self-governance to the industry? Will regulators step in and do it? We've seen this in Korea, we've seen some of this in Japan and in the US. So I think we're at a really exciting intersection. I personally am excited about ICO security tokens, this idea that you can create capital in new ways, but I do see at the same time that we're starting to see an evolution and probably a maturation and a professionalization of what's happening. Yeah, thank you. Minister, do you agree all of them? <laughs> <laughs> I think the base uh, was set is absolutely correct, that the price uh, definitely wasn't rational and um, probably at the beginning uh, who jumped on the ICOs was probably some people were tech savvy who were just excited about it. Some people were just following the money and trying to, to, to earn easy money. And now the price is getting towards more stable and, and, and towards more rational. But in general, probably <clears throat> for uh, countries, I think, especially for small economies uh, like uh, Lithuania, it gives a tremendous opportunities because uh, our uh, startups has raised a terrific amount of money in those half a year, a year time, uh, when they introduced the ICOs. And uh, of course, uh, as a government, we have, have, to, we have had to react, because uh, it's a long way. Sometimes on a, I, I usually read those white papers, and there is terrific ideas, world-changing ideas, but there is a long way from that white paper to actually implementing that idea. So as a government, we had have to react and uh, of course we should be very clear guidelines uh, starting from taxation, uh, paying taxes because probably uh, society cares if, uh, if, uh, if, if do you pay taxes from, from these new activities. Again then uh, who is responsible, uh, whose responsibilities, uh, uh, what is fraud and, and etc. And I think we were the first ones and then uh, a couple other countries followed. Now we see the future with the security tokens, but in general, uh, I think it gives a great opportunity. And for uh, the governments, it's extremely important to set a very clear playing field, but not to, not to interrupt into innovation. That's very important. As uh, it was mentioned before, it's a terrific public infrastructure, 
which gives a great uh, opportunities for uh, new economies, for small economies. Uh, we can't compare in many traditional industrial uh, fields with China or Germany, but as a small economy, in our startups can bring a extremely good and innovative ideas and raise capital, which is extremely conservative in Europe. And in ICO world, it's a little bit different. So in my opinion, it definitely brings a great opportunities, but uh, it, the playing field has to be very clear. And here, I think the dialogue between the, uh, uh, the people who are actually doing it and the government has to be a very sufficient and, and bringing the best results. And as I said, clear playing field usually solves many problems where uh, nobody really wants to deal with the crooks and fraud. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> You are very right that for a um, small country, the uh, uh, policy attitudes might be different from the big ones. So uh, let's imagine you were the uh, uh, regulator of the United States. Are you going to take the different view? Do you think the uh, United States regulator have the uh, right uh, combination of the policies towards innovation also to the uh, ICO and this kind of the regulations? Uh, it's very hard to say. Uh, I, I, I can only speak of from my point of view, uh, and I can say, you know, uh, first of all, you have to view it. Uh, you have to make a decision. Is it a opportunity window, or it's a possible fraud where you have to, you know, close it down as soon as possible? It's a threat for, for, for your financial system and etc. So you have to make a choice here very clearly and choose the path. Uh, for me, it's an opportunity window. It's an opportunity window for innovators. It's an opportunity window to, to, to put a, a infrastructure into the next level, uh, create and implement some great ideas, and especially giving that it's a platform equal for the whole world. It doesn't have a, someone is not ahead. Everyone is at the starting line and in a very close position. So for me, it gives a very clear opportunity window. Uh, my goal as a government regulator is uh, supposed to be to create a favorable environment so that the startup in Lithuania would be able to create international team, bring the best professionals, and offer the solution. Uh, yeah. yeah, great. So Jeremy, how do you look at the uh, regulation action in the United States to the uh, crypto assets? At one hand, I think they are very supportive of the innovation, right? But uh, on the other hand, in the uh, exchanges, when we are, uh, have the exchange of the crypto assets, then the regulation from the United States is very, very uh, regent. They uh, want to uh, change ICO into the STO, uh, security uh, token offering. Then they, uh, the changing of the name means that maybe the nature of the crypto assets will be changed. So when I talk this to the, uh, um, uh, um, actually, um, um, one guy who regulated the uh, crypto assets in the, uh, um, in, the, um, in, the, in the Bank of the, uh, in the Bank of England, and they feel that the ICO is totally different from the STO. STO is not uh, crypto assets anymore. What is your view on that? Yeah. So, I mean, just in general. Uh the U.S. has actually been, um, you know, regulating this space for over five years. So, you know, the U.S. Treasury Department issued regulations on virtual currency exchange five years ago. That set in motion a whole regulatory regime around the currency use cases of crypto. And so, you know, exchangers of cryptocurrency uh, for fiat currency needed to have licenses um, and protect, you know, protect uh, society from money laundering and things like that. So that was five years ago. Uh, the, you know, the trading of commodity assets and things like futures and derivatives, uh, that was regulated by the CFTC and certain licensure given around that. So now there's futures markets that are regulated that are major exchanges. Um, so that's been uh, significant progress in terms of the capital market side of how this works. And then the last piece, which you're referring to, um, the SEC getting involved, I, mean, I think um, <clears throat> In general, it makes sense that we need to uh, protect investors and protect markets from bad actors. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that 90% of ICOs are scams or fraud or, or just not, not serious, some mixture of that. So there's an enormous amount of, of, you know, of challenges for investors and protections from that. And if you look at a lot of exchanges in the world, there's an enormous amount of market manipulation, wash trading, pump and dump schemes. I mean, it's not pretty. And so there, is, there are not capital market protections that, again, society and investors would expect in a mature market. 
Um, so th there have to be some rules established uh, if, if you want this to become an institutional phenomenon and a mainstream phenomenon. Now, I think the challenge that, uh, for the SEC is they gave some high-level guidance, but they didn't give much more, and so it left everyone uncertain, right? What is, what is a utility token? What is a currency token? What is a commodity? And what is a security? And so um, they've, they've been reluctant to give more guidance. Uh, and then I think secondly, when crypto assets are, are very clearly investment contracts and playing the role of an investment contract, um, you know, th there has not been a lot of progress on um, you know, f you know, fundamentally the regulated activity. So what does it take to register a crypto asset with the SEC? What does it take to offer it? Under what exemptions? What does it take to trade it on, on exchanges, on a secondary market? And so there's still a lot of work to do to get clarity, but I would say, you know, we spend a lot of time with the government, including the SEC. They're very focused on getting this right. They really want this to happen. They see the benefits of this as a new uh, innovation in capital formation, as a new innovation in, um, in how businesses can raise capital, um, and, uh, and that's, a, you know, that's tremendous. So there's work to do to, to figure it out. Um, I think you will see a great deal of that in the U.S. market clarified uh, over the next six months. Yeah, please. I actually want to take a somewhat um, contrarian viewpoint. I think one of the challenges is if the idea of blockchain technology is decentralization and permissionless innovation, the idea that you don't have to ask the SEC or regulator for permission, I think one of the things we as an industry have to recognize is we can't be judge and jury and say, this is a worthwhile idea and this isn't. Again, if we believe in permissionless innovation, what it means is we're going to create two alternate systems, and I already see this in the crypto market. One is the path of evolution, businesses like Jeremy's and Mike's, where they work with regulators. They're in jurisdictions that have strong capital markets regulation. Um, they're in jurisdictions that require licensing. And then we see the revolution side, which is firms that have said, you know what, instead of trying to fit what we're doing into this box that in the US, the regulation box for finance has existed for 100 years unchanged. So instead of taking this business model and cramming it into that box, they're saying, I'm going to go to Malta, I'm going to the Isle of Man, to Bermuda, to Barbados, to another jurisdiction where regulators are willing to write completely new rules. And so to me, there's sort of a bifurcation. But I am concerned sometimes when I see regulators taking a very heavy-handed approach or I would say um, a very traditional capital markets approach to cryptocurrencies because these assets aren't stocks. A cryptocurrency should not be a security. Bitcoin is not a security. And so to me, we as an industry also need to change how we write regulation to create room for new types of markets. When the internet was first regulated, the US did something. They created safe harbors. So they said, here are the boundaries within which you can innovate and we're gonna to wait to see what happens before we regulate. And I think the hard part here is because we're touching money. Regulators feel very anxious, they need to do something. Um, it has an impact on economies, economic uh, stability in some places. But I think again, I'm always very uh, cautious to take a balanced approach because the whole point here is we want permissionless financial innovation. And if everything becomes regulated and only accredited investors can buy ICOs because they're now security tokens, that defeats the purpose to me. Can I add to that? Please. Um, so I, I, sorry, I, no, sorry. No, no, it's totally, totally fair. Contradict you there. Totally fair. I mean, I, I think, look, um, this is not going to be a broad-based global mainstream phenomenon if the leading companies have to go to safe haven uh, environments and where there's, you know, basically places that have a reputation for allowing money laundering. That's not going to work. Like, that is not going to make this a mainstream phenomenon. So I think it's very challenging if we think Malta is going to save us in this case. So I would actually look, and I would agree with Melton on a lot of things here, which is I think ICOs and token offerings are different, and we do want to have a framework for those specifically. And I think I would look to, you know, Switzerland has done some interesting work in this. Uh, I think the one to pay the most attention to right now is France. Uh, France is the third largest economy in Europe. They have a major initiative under Macron to create a, a framework for ICOs. They have a very favorable tax regime which just passed this week. Uh, they really want to see a clear regulatory framework 
that is really oriented towards the benefits of crowdfunding with some minimal investor protections, but really open-ended in the definition. It's not jamming this into securities law. It's saying there's ICO regulation, but it's very, it's, it's very lightweight. It is a bit of a safe harbor. It creates a framework for that. So I would pay attention to large markets like that that are pushing forward. I think you're also going to see legislation introduced in the US uh, in Congress in the near future, which aims to create a kind of ICO uh, framework uh, that would be outside of traditional securities law. It may have some uh, enforcement or oversight from the SEC, uh, but which really starts to define these types of token offerings as a new class of uh, financial capital. Yeah. Uh, before I move to Mike, uh, let me ask you to a very quick question. Do you think Bitcoin is a currency? Uh, Bitcoin is more like a commodity. Uh, it behaves more like a commodity. Uh, long term, it could be a currency. Long term, uh, but short term, yeah. No. I mean, it's it's a it's a store of value. It's a non-sovereign store of value. Um, it is <coughs> has an economic model that is uh, uh, and an economic philosophy similar to gold, uh, and so gold is a commodity. Um, I think the reason why, um, you know, but, but gold was currency. Sure, gold was commodity. But now, had, commodity that had attributes that made it useful as a currency. Yeah. Uh, and I think Bitcoin has attributes that make it really useful as a currency as well, but it doesn't meet the definition of a medium of exchange and yeah. unit of account that are at least, uh, at least for mainstream payments use yeah. cases. And that's okay. Yeah, that's true. Like, it's good to have a long term store of value that, that is digital. I mean, that's really powerful. So yeah. we shouldn't May run away from that. Yeah, maybe Mike first, then Mel. Yeah. So, so I don't think we need to try to define what for example, Bitcoin is at the moment. For but example, if we cannot define, how can we react? Oh, please allow me to explain. Yeah, sure. So, for example, mm -hmm. in Japan, right, the the bill passed the parliament um, in 2016. That was part of the Payments Act. So, at the time, the Japanese government looked at Bitcoin from a payments perspective. Actually, when you look at Singapore now, they're also going to revise their Payments Act and include virtual currency. And Bitcoin is part of that virtual currency yeah. amendment that they're gonna put in the Payments Act. So from that perspective, the government looked at Bitcoin as a payment, yeah. as, at least from an Asia perspective, or Japan, which is one of the largest economic powerhouse, to put the first legislation in, and that was part of the Payments Act. And when they were, so that means the bill they were working on was at least six months to a year before that. So that's 2015. So from the government perspective, there was only Bitcoin. Maybe a little bit of Ethereum, but Ethereum, the government officials never really looked at at the time. Now with the whole ICO, it's really changed everything, right? So from a payments perspective, every government has some kind of framework or guideline around the how you can do KYC, AML, and digital payments. Yeah. When it becomes an ICO, where it has the characteristic of a security, yeah. then it becomes a very so different So it, it seems to me that the Bitcoin has the two um, sides of the nature. One side is kind of currency, one side is assets. As asset, we have to regulate as an asset, as securities. But as a currency, but now it's not currency at all, it's a kind of a interesting hybrid. Not the currency at all. We don't know how to regulate, how to react to it. And it's not a, a pure asset either. So yes, how can so we make the balance? So I think that's why Japan created a new <laughs> legislation, yeah. like amending the Payments Act. And within that, there's some basic things from a government perspective that they always care about. And the biggest thing is KYC. Know your customer. Who are the people who are buying it? And from an anti-money laundering or counter-financing of terrorism. So you mean the trend is from a viewing it as a currency um, first, and now move on to view it as a more on the security and assets. Exactly, especially- So Mountain will not like that way, that direction, I, I, I right? I don't think anyone's looking at Bitcoin as a security. No one, I haven't seen anyone. As, a, as an asset, yes, as property, yes. As a commodity asset, yes, but that's totally different than being an investment contract. A security is an investment contract, it is an offering to investors for capital in exchange for a return on that capital. That is not what a commodity represents. So regulating Bitcoin as a, as a financial asset, as a commodity asset, that's pretty much how it's being viewed and as, as a payment system as well, but not as a security. I don't think there's anyone anywhere in the world yeah. who's considering regulating it as yeah, a security. I think the uh, yeah. ex 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 experiences in the Japan is very interesting because the Japan view Bitcoin as a currency. 
then it, as a currency, we have to uh, look at the potential of the, uh, we, we just take Bitcoin as an example, uh, view the potential of the Bitcoin as a currency. When we uh, look at the efficiency of the Bitcoin or the efficiency of blockchain, uh, block, blockchain, it's very, very low because you have to report to everyone. So the efficiency is, is zero. If we have a huge, uh, if we have the all population in the world to transaction on the blockchain, then the efficiency is zero because it's huge. So how do you look at the potential of the Bitcoins to become the real currency in terms of the uh, transaction? Yeah, please. So I think, uh, I mean, it's probably, you, you mentioned before the discussion in a 10, ten years perspective, but I can't see it uh, in, a, in a very close future. First of all, I think some societies should start by going cashless, and uh, we see yeah. many nations uh, that uh, really use uh, cards rarely. We have some great examples, like Sweden, where it's uh, under 9% yeah. uh, population use, use cash, but let's start with that. And then again, uh, currency, uh, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think it's exactly very well described, and most of the governments see it as a commodity, as a possible investment, uh, regulated, uh, very well described, uh, but not a, as a currency uh, for a long, in, in a long-term perspective, I don't think so. We might have some, uh, some stories, you know, we, we know that uh, ICOs are extremely um, well known in Asia, but Europe, it's a different story. United States, again, if you look, if you look at the um, market share, uh, Asia is, is dominating here, so we might have, you know, different regulations in Asia, but uh, coming to Europe, Eurozone, a Eurozone, for example, I can see it happening as a, as a currency and so on. Yeah, so um, Mike, you want to, um, Mike, yeah, you yeah. want to finish because, yeah, yeah I well, so interrupt you, I'm sorry about that. So obviously, long term, as the innovation and similar to like the internet, it, it improves. When, it, when internet first happened, obviously even before the Netscape moment, right, there was a long period where it was inefficient, it was clunky. When everybody in the world connected, there wasn't enough IP address. So all these things, but over time, technology <laughs> innovation allows um, it to become more efficient and productive. So in the long run, you, you, you think that a, uh Bitcoin can be a not only currency. Bitcoin, all other protocols. Yeah. It, it, it could be side It could be many things that will allow the blockchain, Bitcoin, and other protocols to address and solve many pain points that exist today. Yeah, interesting. Right. Um, before I open the floor, I will ask our panelists about the, another uh, angle of discussion, and maybe uh, you can join us a little later. So, uh, uh, Minister, touch upon the. Uh, um, a kind of uh, role of the uh, uh, cashless, um, f uh, some feature of the feature and the role of the um, crypto assets uh, towards the uh, cashless economy. So because we, we don't like the uh, cash, uh, because a lot of the cost to store and transfer the, uh, the, the paper money. So the uh, digital money can be a lot of efficiency, a lot of the good things there, and we can have this smart contract and maybe monetary policy uh, you know, uh, some innovation and some intervention there. And also we can have a lot of interesting things, a lot of the good story and future for the uh, cashless economy. Then my question is, towards the uh, cashless economy, do we need a private crypto or digital currency or we should rely on the uh, public digital currency, which is called CBDC, Central Banking Digital Currency, or a digital fiat currency? Is this competition between the private and the public, Mountain? Sure, so the way I view it is central banks play an important role in a country's economy. And for as long as we can remember, people have been defined by nation states. A few weeks ago, I was in Vienna at Eurofi, which is a gathering of all of Europe's finance ministers and central bankers, BIS, um, and we had an interesting conversation over a dinner where the question became, who has the right to print money? Yeah. And historically, if you had an army and if you had an economy, you had the right to print money. And the world has changed a lot since then. What I think is interesting, particularly for my generation, is we're starting to shift from physical economies where people are defined by the borders of a nation state, where they're defined by their citizenship, 
to a digital economy where people are much more mobile, they live in many different places, maybe they hold different passports, maybe they're an Estonian e-resident or a resident of another nation as well. Um, the idea to me of digital currencies is we have all of these different digital economies, these digital communities in which people participate online that share different philosophical beliefs. Likewise, I got into Bitcoin in 2012, and back then Bitcoin was much more ideological in nature. It was a community of people who shared a set of philosophical values and social values, and the monetary system of Bitcoin is modeled on some of those values. Some of these new digital currencies, these new blockchains, these ICOs are very similar in that it's taking people who believe in a certain set of social or philosophical beliefs, digital economy, a digital community, a digital nation state, and they're building their own monetary systems. I think that's much more so for utility tokens than STOs and asset-backed uh, tokens. But I do think we're in the middle of a very critical shift in the way that people think about the role of money and the role of identity and where they belong and how they identify and express that. And so to me, I certainly see a role for central bank issued digital currencies, but also the evolution of new types of digital currencies, corporate digital currencies. So Rakuten is issuing digital currency. Um, there are a few other corporations that I work with closely that are looking at creating their own economic ecosystem where they issue assets themselves or issue currency themselves. Um, Jeremy's issuing a currency. So I think, again, there's this really interesting evolution of how we think about the borders of an economy and the borders of a financial system. And so to me, that's really the exciting innovation. Yeah, so Malcolm, in, in the long run, at the end of the day, do you think government will disappear, nation will disappear? No, no, <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm advocating for. There's certainly a very important role that governments play, but I do increasingly see the private sector playing a very important role. Um, and I think that what I would like to see, what I think leads to optimal outcomes for everyone, is a closer collaboration between the private sector and the public sector. I don't think we need highly centralized, very large planned governments. Um, I think we're already starting to see challenges. If we look at the refugee crisis in yeah. Europe, right, there are a lot of challenges that arise when you have very closely coordinated governments. And even in the US, I feel bad for regulators in the US for trying to keep up with ICOs, especially the SEC. They're underfunded. They don't have enough staff. And now we're dropping this whole new problem into their laps. Um, so I think, again, what I'd love to see is the private sector, particularly the innovation economy, startups, entrepreneurs, collaborate more closely with governments to start to fill some of these holes to solve challenging problems that not one nation can solve alone. Yeah, so kind of the PPP, public and the private partnership exactly. in, in the long run. But it's, it's, it's really uh, in your uh, long-term view of the uh, um, the very diversified and uh, very uh, well governed by ourselves in in the, on the earth. Maybe not the uh, uh, today's government. Uh, the today's government and tomorrow's government is huge different. Do we have a venue towards that, Jeremy? Yeah, I, there's a lot we could talk about here. It's a great subject. I I, I very much agree. I think. You know, an open internet architecture for value exchange is really, really powerful. And, and actually, not just value exchange, but sort of the ability to arrange, to, to foster economic arrangements among participants in a trustless fashion is really revolutionary and changes how we govern things, how we organize communities, what a corporation even is, how it exists. So I think we're in the early stages of a kind of reconceptualization of what corporations are, what economic arrangements are, how they work globally, how money and value moves. So it's a, it's a really wonderful time, and I think we'll look back in 10 years uh, similarly to how we look back you know, to the last 10 or 20 years in terms of the Internet of Information uh, and the change it's had. Specifically on, on the topic um, of central bank digital currencies or, or whatnot, I, I, I think you know, our long-term view is that there will be non-sovereign global uh, currencies. Uh, that are broadly broadly adopted and used, um, and that that is uh, not likely to happen in the very short term. Um, but it's very clear the technology is going to make that possible, and that would be very attractive to economic actors uh, uh, and individuals potentially to have that. How that maps to taxation and governance is a completely separate issue. But I think we are we are headed and have to have non-sovereign, stable value uh, uh, currencies, digital currencies, in the short term. 
our view has been that what we want to do is we want to unlock the power of blockchain platforms uh, and the, the stability and, uh, and sort of uh, economic uh, uh, regularity of fiat. And so uh, we created a, a system called Center, uh, which is launching actually very soon. And Center is an open source technology and an open standard scheme for issuing fiat uh, stable coins. So for issuing dollar coins, yen coins, you know, euro coins, et cetera. And um, it, it's a whole governance scheme for how to do that. Um, and Circle's launching the first uh, US dollar coin uh, very, very imminently. And um, we think that's going to be very powerful if you can have uh, you know, essentially uh, instant settlement uh, at very low cost uh, with high levels of security to any internet connected device in the world with fiat money, that's much more powerful than the fiat money that, than we have today. And then when you layer on top of that, the ability to program and, and build economic contracts using smart contracts around that fiat money, then you can open up completely new forms of economic arrangements uh, whether they're investment or, 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 or even just uh, basic forms of contracting between parties. So um, fiat stable coins, we think, will be, uh, fr from an industry perspective, not from central banks, but from an industry perspective, will be the next wave and will probably get broad, broad adoption in the next few years and may, in fact, be the killer app of blockchain, at least from a payments perspective, uh, that people have been looking for for a long time. Yeah, the precondition is that the central bank can accept you. Yeah, I mean, this is essentially a payment system innovation. I mean, central banks accepted Visa and UnionPay and uh, SWIFT and other payment system innovations. So fundamentally, this is just a new record-keeping model and transaction settlement model. Uh, but you're still dealing with banks that are regulated, that hold the reserves, and the monetary policy is controlled by the central banks. And so it, it, it mirrors the monetary system. Yeah but with a radical improvement in the uh, ability to conduct transactions and form capital. Yeah, a very short technical question. When you have this platform and uh, this system, do you use the uh, blockchain, uh, black coin, uh, sorry, blockchain uh, technology purely only, or you uh, use other kind of the technology too, like the uh, real-time uh, GS, RTGS, this kind of old system technologies? No, it's all built on public blockchains. The initial, uh, what we call reference implementation, is built on Ethereum. Um, and that's really the only platform that works today uh, for these kinds of applications. There are other experimental blockchains that don't really work yet, uh, but yeah. which could in the coming years. And so uh, as more public blockchains emerge that can tokenize assets and run code, uh, we'll look at those too. Yeah, Mike? Yeah, so, so not all currencies or you know, between the public and private. When you look, look now, already when you look at loyalty points, telco credits, they're creating an ecosystem where they can use those points or, or your telco credits to buy goods, like normal goods. And that is completely separate from a central bank controlled system, right? Already central banks, whether they go issue their own cryptocurrency or go cashless, what people want is something that is better, faster, and cheaper, right? And if that happens through a government-issued cryptocurrency or an e-cash or digital cash, that's good. But also, there's a big private sector that currently uses existing technology to provide loyalty points, Amex points, telco credits, and all those. All of these are going to go digital. Some will use blockchain. Some will continue to use um, centralized technology to do that. Um, what will happen when you look at five and 10 years is the market will decide, right? Do you really want a stable token that is pegged to the US dollar? Or do you want something that is stable across digital assets? There's a lot of initiatives that are going and the market will dictate. The, the best thing is that innovation is being fostered right now. Right. And if it looks more as a, if it touches fiat, there's a lot of existing regulation that's coming in. If it doesn't and it's more utility, it's going to be more innovative and a lot of people will come in. If it's like an asset or a security, then existing security laws will come in. So as an exchange, we need to be able to cope to all of that. Yeah, so that market decide, but where's the monetary uh, policy? 
Yeah, well, no, I think I think when, when you... the, uh, a lot of the uh, currency used by this group of people, that group of people, and but it's outside the fiat currency system, then how can monetary policy have a role on the uh, rest of the system? Well, no, I think so. That's where when it exchanges with fiat. So you are going to have monetary policy there. No, no, well, well, that's why we work with governments okay. on it, right? So yeah. obviously there's an initiative around SROs, like yeah. self-regulating organization. For example, specifically in Japan, that's actually an extension of the government. The, that organization needs the blessing of the government, and where the government cannot define each legislation to the detail, that's where the SRO comes in. Again, it might be a little different globally, but in Japan, that's how it works. So as a regulated exchange, we will always work with the government. From our perspective, it's not it's not an option or a privilege to work. It's it's yeah, a it's a necessity yeah, to work with. Actually, it. long way to go to to tackle all this issue, but very tricky, very uh, complex, and very important role of the government. Yeah. So, to begin with, I probably wouldn't be so optimistic separating uh, uh, business and the government straight away and saying um, that uh, feeling bad for the U.S. Uh, government. Um, we probably can remember. 20 years ago, uh, when financial markets were completely differently, uh, differently uh, organized. And then we have 10 years ago a financial crisis where overpaid, overstaffed, financial banks, they just went down. And many of them in the countries looked at the governments actually with the wide eyes to bail them out. So don't be so confident. <laughs> at the end of the day you, day, you need a government. And of course, the government role, first of all, has to be open and let the innovators create. But on the other hand, it also has to protect because it's a great opportunity for a fraud, for a very quick fraud to fool people. And in some countries, it can end up with a very bad crisis when the people have put their assets in and when people lose their money, lots of things can happen. So I wouldn't be so optimistic separating uh, the business here and, and the government. I think the government's role is very important. Of course, the governments will always drag their feet behind the innovators. That's absolutely normal and clear. Uh, many of the government doesn't really even understand what is ICOs and so on. It's uh, probably, it took uh, some people in the business already work for five, uh, seven years in it, and then the government's only discussing it now. Uh, so, of course, it will take time, but uh, the playing field has to be regulated for sure. I think it will also put some additional uh, um, competition between the governments, uh, who will have actually the most favorable uh, playing field to attract uh, the companies uh, to invest and so on. As I said, it creates uh, new opportunities, but it has to work hand in hand with the governments and separating it from the central banks, it, it will create a, a additional shadow and lose the trust. Yeah. I think now it's time for us to, to uh, yeah, open the floor for the discussion. Oh, a lot of hands. So we collect the, all the questions together, then we uh, throw them to the panelists. Gentlemen, please. Please identify who you are and very brief question, please. I'm Martin Brunska. I'm a technology investor based in London. I'm also advisor to the European Commissioner for R&D and Innovations. Okay. I have a question for the minister. So what would a kind of a perfect uh, digital stable currency look like for you? And also taking into account the, the consideration that according to the European legislation, the only uh, currency we can have in Europe, uh, fiat currency, is the euro. Great question. The, the gentleman here, yeah. So my name is Monty Metzger from LCX Liechtenstein Cryptocurrency Exchange. My question is to Jeremy Allaire. Um, we see that the crypto asset market is just at the beginning compared to other financial assets. So how um, strong are institutional and professional investors already in that space and what's blocking them for entering it? Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Yeah, the gentleman there. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, my name is Oren from Horizon State. We just won the um, award for technology pioneers, and we're presenting a cryptocurrency blockchain company. Just as a suggestion for the panel, I would like you to consider a different type of asset, which is not monetary necessarily, a blockchain asset. Um, I think we've heard from Jeremy that 90% of the you know, ICOs might have been scams. We probably represent a small minority of 10% who are trying to do something good. And we are providing an asset which is not necessarily a link to, to any kind of cryptocurrency, even though we have our own. And I'm quite interested to hear from the panel what are the, those assets and how these governments could use these assets in, for the greater good because we are innovating faster than possibly you know, what we could have imagined a decade ago. 
Yeah, very good question. Then, yeah, the gentleman behind. Yeah. Hi, um, uh, my name is Stefano. I'm a member of the Goba Shippers community, also a technology investor. Um, my question is about wealth distribution in crypto assets. Um, which is probably the elephant in the room, I think. Uh, may, may, as, as many other assets, uh, the owners of, of cryptocurrencies are actually the very few, right? Uh, an example is Consensus, which is uh, one of the largest Ethereum investors, and many people in the field actually think of it as a big conflict of interest. So I really wonder what is the opinion of the panelists about uh, the, the effect of, of this really skilled wealth um, ownership. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah gentlemen here. Thank you. Uh, I'm the CEO of a CVC of Coach Group, the leading group of Turkey. I'm addressing my question to Mr. Eller and Mr. Kayamori. Uh, it's a little bit value uh, relevant question. Um, if you look at the fluctuation pattern of these cryptocurrencies during the very last years, I mean, uh, almost always uh, there's been a, an upwards movement uh, value-wise among uh, these cryptocurrencies on the very fourth quarter of these all past years. Would you expect the same to happen this year? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, maybe. Uh, OK, yeah. Uh, from Jeremy first. And you can pick your, uh, the questions you would like to answer and, and some questions for you, really. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to try and remember the questions uh, uh, that, are, that I can answer. Um, I think yeah, the, the yeah, yeah, institutional investor. Yeah, I'll actually. start with that. Yeah, so on the institutional side, um, you know, uh, this is always the kind of uh, the, the, the promise is that this is going to become an institutional market and that all of a sudden all of the pension funds and investment funds are all going to have an ownership in Bitcoin and the price will be 40000 and it's going to be wonderful. Um, that, that's sort of been, been a, a kind of thesis. Um, I think what we've seen is um, a lot of the, the activity, of course, last year was retail. Uh, uh, Jeremy, sorry, because of time, very brief, please. Very brief. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fine. Basically, uh, a lot of institutions are, are getting involved. Uh, there are more and more that are creating the ability to do this. They're making sure that legally they have a way to do it. Technically, they have a, a way to custody these. And they're establishing relationships with trading platforms uh, to do this. I think a lot of capital from the institutional sector is still on the sidelines because they're waiting for the next major set of catalysts uh, that are moving this market, because they don't want to start entering this market when there's still sell-side pressure. So I think fundamentally, the, there is an enormous amount of institutional activity happening. We're very involved in a lot of it, and we will see a significant amount of new investing activity on the institutional side when we see the market start to recover. Yeah, thank you. Melton. I'll address the question around wealth distribution. Um, I think this is an area that I'm personally very passionate about. And I do agree, most cryptocurrencies today are not decentralized at all. Um, if anyone's interested, I've published extensive research online about how cryptocurrency is not decentralized at any layer. But most importantly, I think this economic premise of fairness and equality has not yet been realized. And it is very problematic. I think in Bitcoin, 20% of the Bitcoin are owned by the top 100 wallets. Um, Ethereum, it's even worse. In Ripple, it's something like 70%. So not very decentralized. Um, I think one of the important things that we as industry can do is introduce new metrics by which we measure platforms and protocols. Um, I introduced nine metrics to sort of measure the degree of decentralization in these platforms, one of which is effectively a wealth Gini coefficient. Um, but I think, again, disclosure, investor disclosure, investor transparency, similar to the way that an institution might disclose the positions it holds or an analyst may disclose the positions they have an interest in and their direct family has an interest in, can go a long way towards at least reducing the amount of moral hazard and information asymmetry that exists in this industry. Um, but again, I think there are people experimenting with ideas of fair coins, coins that are distributed to every person um, in some sort of new structure that are interesting. But so long as money and the acquisition of coins are coupled, meaning if you invest, you get to own X percent of tokens in a protocol, this is going to be very difficult to overcome. And at the end of the day, I've always said, if a venture investor owns 50% of the tokens in the new internet, as a consumer, I don't want to use that internet. So to me, until we solve that problem, it'll be very difficult to build globally usable networks and applications. Yeah, Mike? OK, so I think we addressed institution, um, skew of wealth. I'll talk about price. So um, <clears throat> maybe only price. <clears throat> we don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, 
There was a big <laughs> ramp up in China, and mm -hmm. that was 2013, and then the Mt. Gox incident happened. It took about two and a half years to recover. Um, there was a big ramp up l late last year, and there's been a big correction now. Um, statisticians will say that end of the year, prices will go up. But then again, when, when it has gone up last year to that amount and there's a correction, I think there's going to be, it's going to take a little bit more time um, for that correction to take place. And all these custody problems and all these things, the market is trying to make it more legitimate for institutions and people to come in. So with that, I think that's going to be the next wave. Yeah, thank you. Minister? Very briefly, I think, first of all, it's safe and secure because uh, uh, if we're talking about Europe, it's extremely conservative. Not even all EU countries uh, are in Eurozone. And uh, if you look at the societies, not all of them even trust banks. So talking about the digi dig digital currency, it's a long way. So starting with the safe and secure, that's probably the answer. Yeah. Uh, we only um, have a few minutes that uh, I think it's time for us to wrap up. Uh, I would like to, uh, like, like to ask you a very interesting question. If we think about the year 2050, why 2050? Because uh, there's a saying that in 2050, the AI will have a, a general AI and might be super AI. Then, then the ro robotics may have the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, intelligence of the human being. Then that is a very critical, critical moment for the human being. So my question for you is that in 2050, do you think uh, which, one, which currency will take place of the United States dollar's role today, which accounts for uh, around 50 or 60 uh, share of the uh, global payment? I, I am, from a government perspective, will stick with the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Mike? Oh, my. So that's 32 years from now. Yeah. Right? So um, again, 32 years before the internet just started. So um, it's very difficult. I, I think I, it could be Bitcoin. It could be something else. And it, it, with the advancement of technology and with the digital age really in prosperity, I think there's a possibility that, uh, it, it, but it could be a central bank one as well. Again, but I think it will be a non-sovereign, uh, like a public one that will be embraced by, by the people. Yeah, Melton? I think as global macro instability increases in our world and um, the trust that people have in institutions gets eroded as more and more macro crises um, impact, particularly people's savings, people's well-being, their livelihood. I think we will see an evolution towards people choosing to hold currencies that are more transparently governed. And so my view is more towards public and less for, towards a central bank issued. But only time will tell. And I've been wrong about many things. So who knows? Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, I think um, uh, non-sovereign uh, algorithmic AI mediated global currencies will be dominant within that time frame. Then do we have a global central bank for this currency? We, we have policies that govern the AIs. Yeah, so we leave us to the AI. Great, let's wait for the 2050 to brace the AI, the pure AI. Thank you very much. Thank you our panelists and thank you so much. Interesting.